Good afternoon, everyone, or I should say evening. Thanks for stopping by on this talk about remote work. I know it's already quite late during the conference. Uh, there's still a closing keynote, so that's good. Um, I want to talk about remote work. Also, for those people who are watching remotely on YouTube, uh, welcome as well. I'm trying to be remote friendly here. A little bit about myself. I'm Vincent. I work for the Trello team as an engineering manager. I'm Dutch, you might have heard that, but I do work from the office in New York. Who's using Trello here in the audience? Oh, quite a few, that's good. I have one disclaimer to make. I actually work from an office, so you're going to hear about remote from someone who works in the office, so sorry for that. But I'm going to explain you well as well that it doesn't matter a whole lot. It doesn't matter too much that you actually work in the office or somewhere else. The one thing you should remember about this slide is basically my Twitter handle. If you have any questions, comments, or whatsoever, you want to have a discussion afterwards, feel free to hit me up. I do want to start with the case for an office, right? Because we have been doing that for a long time, um, decades, maybe even centuries, I actually don't know. And that's how collaboration happens. And collaboration happens quite easily because we're all together, co-located, we can easily uh, see each other, hang out with each other, and have discussions if, if required. A lot of things happen automatically when you're in office space. Uh, even culture emerges, whether it's good or bad, but it emerges quite easily. And also serendipity happens. So you see each other at the coffee machine or at the water cooler, you have a conversation, or during lunch you have a conversation and you actually solve a problem. So that's all good. You can also hang out with your coworkers if you're into that, so it's also nice and social to actually hang out with, with people. These are just a few examples why you say, hey, offices are great and everyone should be in an office. And I'm not trying to say you should not be in an office. But there are, there's a case against an office as well. Not all offices are, are great. Some people have really nice offices. Some people have less nice offices. Some people uh, are not a big fan of open office plans. Like, are there any big fans of open office plans here? Uh, three hands, that was what I was expecting. But it's always like an interesting topic to discuss, but let's not get into that. One other thing you could say against offices like, hey, commutes. Uh, I sometimes hear horrible stories about people having really long commutes. I commute every day in New York City, which is can be fun as well, especially with the subway. It was not always reliable. But even my brother-in-law, I think he has a 90-minute drive every day to work. So that's three hours a day, which is around 600 hours a year. So think about that, so how much time you spend in a car, either standing still, not depends on how much traffic there is. But that's on a personal level. The offices also have a, a big impact on the community around, like in a positive or negative sense. Uh, this is a, a graph from the Bay Area, where basically tech pushed everything out. So if you're not a worker in tech, then you basically have a problem because you can't afford living in the city anymore. So it has a real community impact. And it actually forces people to commute for three hours because they can't afford living close to the city anymore because it kind of like slowly expands. A uh, good example of that is, as well is quite recent, Amazon is moving HQ2 to New York City, which is kind of interesting because it's already a pretty full city, but they're going to add 50,000 people more. So the whole neighborhood is like thinking, hey, what's going to happen to, to this area? And the government is filling it with like one half billion, which is an interesting choice as well. But there are alternatives. And the alternative is like, hey, why not go remote? However, when you start to discuss remote and, and discuss people, hey, should you give it a try? Uh, a lot of comments happen, right? And people actually panicking from, hey, why should we do it? It doesn't fit our culture. Uh, we tried to do remote, but everyone who was remote actually got fired or got laid off because they were so invisible. So doing it right is really important. That's not always that easy. So you have to figure out like how to do it well. But there is an interesting fact that we all do already quite a lot of remote collaboration. Uh, who of you have been on a video call, let's say, the last month? Almost everyone. So we're already doing it quite a bit. And the interesting fact is because we're in an office space, like we try to mimic office behavior uh, in, in a remote setting, which can be interesting. There are quite a few things about how to work remote and the types of remote work you can have. Uh, you have distributed, I think many of us will have it. You have separate offices either in the same city or scattered across the country or even like continents. We also do occasional remote. I think everyone's sometimes like, hey, I'm gonna stay at home today because I have to pick something up or I have to go to a doctor. It happens a lot as well. You also see quite a few companies, they have a few people they allow to work remotely as well. And they say, hey, you don't wanna lose this particular person, we actually want to retain them, so let them 
uh, work remotely. And then there's the last one, and that's the one I want to talk about, and that's being remote friendly. And that basically means, as a rule, everyone can be remote, and you even hire remote people. So it's not like, hey, you already hired someone, that person was in the office for a few years, and now they want to move on, so let's go. Let's have them remotely. Basically, actually hire people you, that are remote from the get-go. Before we get into that, I want to discuss a story about monkeys. And you might have heard it already. There was an experiment done, I think, 40-ish years ago. It's called the Five Monkey Experiment. And you might be wondering, hey, why am I hearing a, a monkey story right now? The interesting thing is what they did. They had a cage. They put a ladder in the middle of it and a banana on top of the ladder. And they put two monkeys in. And you know what happens when a monkey sees a banana. They run up the ladder to get it as soon as they can. But what happened, whenever they got, uh, when they got on the ladder, they were sprayed wet, both of them. So they were basically punished. It's a bit cruel. Sorry for that. It actually happened. And whenever that happened, they were sprayed wet. So they didn't want to do it anymore. So what they did, a new monkey was put in the cage. One was removed. And the first thing that monkey obviously does, like, get up the ladder. But the other monkey knew, hey, I'm going to get sprayed wet. So try to pull him off the ladder so it doesn't happen anymore. And the fun fact is, when they replaced all the monkeys, whenever they put in a new monkey, the other monkey always, like, did put, uh, beat it, did beat up the other monkey, but the monkey didn't know why. And I think it's the same with remote work. We have been working in conditions and being in an office space for so long. We're trying to mimic and copy that behavior a lot of time, and that's where it often goes a bit wrong. I have a fairly short agenda. I want to talk about two main things, like why should we go remote? Why should we even consider it? So if you need some ammunition, hopefully this is helpful, uh, but there are a lot of benefits to it. The other one is like, hey, if you decide to go remote, how does it actually work, and, and, and what are the things you need to sort out to make it successful? So let's start with the first one. Why even consider going remote? And I think first and foremost, at least for us, it's like having access to talent. Because suddenly you increase your talent pool a big time, especially if you're in an area where there's a lot of competition, whether you're in the Bay Area or uh, somewhere else, like competition is hot, like you suddenly have like the ability to hire wherever you want. It's kind of an interesting thing also for people. There's one thing that probably is interesting is like how do you deal with junior people because that's probably will be rough for people to just say hey you're junior you're just getting started in a professional life how does it actually work we try tend to have these people uh, in an office space so we can give them a little bit more guidance but we're experimenting as well like i have them join remotely too and as an interesting fact it's an approximate thing it's like we have around 84 percent of our people are apply are applying remotely so we suddenly have a 5x on our talent pool which is if you see how hard it is to get x then that's quite a quite an interesting number and we didn't have to do a whole lot for it other than actually say hey you can work wherever you want it's also comes back in 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 some surveys, right? This is the Stack Overflow survey. It w happens to be a very remote company as well. And you see it in the top five of like, hey, what's important for you in your career? It's next to compensation, technologies you use, and also options to grow. So people find it very important to say, hey, can I work remotely? Because that's a big decision in, in, in whenever I decide to work for a company. That's more like access to talent. There are also some other benefits around talent as well. First of all, diversity, and it's a hot topic. Uh, these days, but they're actually having people from around the world or even like in different pockets of the country. It's kind of interesting that you get a lot of different perspectives. So you don't hire only people that live in this this bubble in a specific city with a certain mindset, but you have people living in more rural areas, living in city urban areas. So you get a lot of different different perspective within your teams, and that's beneficial for for the success of your team. The other one is retention. And retention is important as well. Already mentioned the example when people, when you have select people going remotely, you actually have like, hey, let's keep this person around. But suddenly people can, based on the phase of the life, they can actually decide where they want to be, whether they want to be in an office space, in an urban area, for example, or they want to go to a quieter place where in a more suburban area. So you basically you have a lot of flexibility about, about that. So that's people don't decide to actually leave, but they actually stay within the company, which is pretty good, and it's a really nice, nice outcome as well. 
it also gives a lot of flexibility for basically everyone, right? Uh, even if you're in office space like me, you can go remote occasionally, which is kind of interesting. You can just easily uh, work from wherever you want. And it's kind of interesting because normally that's something you can do as well. But if you're the only person going remote for, let's say, a week, you're kind of disrupting the workflow of your team. If your team already is set up to work remotely, that's not the case anymore, which is, which is very, very nice. And you can just say, I'm not here and nobody cares basically because like business continues as, as usual. Also around families, for example, if you have a few days where you have to drop off kids or you have to run for an errand, like it gives a lot of flexibility in like how you deal in your personal life. And I think it creates a better uh, work-life balance as well because you skip out the commute and keep things really close to your home. And that brings me to like a peace of mind as well, which partially goes back to the retention piece. Like you can, you have a lot of freedom. If you have to move back closer to your family, it doesn't hit your career. You can basically say, hey, I can make life decisions that are not impacting my, my, my career directly. That's, they, those are kind of getting decoupled, which is really good. It also has a few interesting side effects. And the first one is actually productivity. And we already discussed when I just mentioned uh, who likes open work plans and not a lot of people uh, raise their raise their hand because it's actually interesting, right? Because if you're in an office, the amount of disturbance you have is quite quite, ho quite a lot. Anyone heard the comment say, I'm working from home today because I want to get some things done? Does it, sound, does it sound familiar? I think it does. And that's kind of interesting because we kind of design an, an office to collaborate, but also to get stuff done, right? And that's kind of what you can do in your home office. You can really get focused and get deep, deep work, which is important, especially like uh, for a lot of knowledge work. It's also important that you focus on, on, start to focus on output because you don't see people anymore. So they can be wherever they want, wherever they are, but you really have to focus, hey, what are they producing? How are they contributing to the team? Do they, are they building up the team? And that's something you really have to start focusing on, focusing on because basically having a button in the seat doesn't count anymore because people can be in the office for 12 hours, but they can doing whatever they want. And the last thing, and that's especially valid for a tool like Trello, for example, is like, hey, we create a better product with it. Because collaboration is kind of like a core business, and by using our, our own tool extensively, I think it gives a lot of good feedback for the tool. So that might not be true for everyone, depends on like which area you're in, but for us it like gives a lot of input in, in, in our product as well. One other thing, actually, is that because you have a, such a more diverse theme, it's kind of interesting that you get different angles and different use cases uh, in your product as well, so that's, that's really nice. And lastly, uh, just having a safe space for people to actually do their best work. Uh, people go pretty nuts, like how to build up kind of like their home office and their office as well, which is really nice. Uh, so you can do whatever you want. You can create a space you always wanted to work in. Um, if you look at some of the details, I'm not sure how good it is to see. You see some lighting on one of the monitors because having a good good video quality is really important as well. We come back to that later. But it's actually interesting to see that people like putting a lot of technology in place. Some people have really fancy uh, fancy microphones to actually make the quality as good as possible. But you can go do whatever you want. Okay, that's kind of like why you should do it, and hopefully everyone kind of thinks, or maybe if you're already here, you already think it's a great idea. But how can you make it work? What, where do you should you focus on to actually make things happen? Well, and I think it's important to realize that the devil is in the detail with doing remote work. It's actually, if you look back at it, it's actually fairly straightforward, like which strategies you should apply, but it's all these little details that add up to make it like a good or a bad experience for people. And I want to discuss three angles. I kind of said, like, hey, I have a short agenda, but there is an agenda and an agenda. So a little bit of an agenda inception here. And there are three things to I want to focus on. First, like, hey, how do you work and play as a remote team? The other one is, like, how do you build a remote office? And the last one, like, and the most important one, how do you build a remote culture? Because that's hard doing it in a remote environment. And you ne need to do be very deliberate about it to actually make that work. So let's start with the first one. How do you stay productive in a remote environment? That's what a lot of people ask. And like, hey, how do you deal with that? And the answer is pretty simple. And you could call it remote friendly. I like to use the term assume remote. And it basically means like if there is one person remote, everyone should go remote. No uh, big screens, 
with people's faces. Just if one person goes remote, everyone goes remote. And that's kind of like quite impactful, right? Because you, if someone, if you decide as a team that it's actually a good idea, then you have to make changes how you work as a team. And that's something you have to keep in, in mind. And I want to show you kind of the opposite of that. This is uh, photos I made myself, which happened in offsite uh, a few months ago. One team member was able to travel, and you see this, his face on the screen. And I'm pretty sure it was kind of a horrible experience for him, because like watching it, a lot of people interact. Probably we had some mic issues as well, so having it, uh, being able to understand is pretty rough. And also like looking at a room full of people for five hours in a row, that's, that's pretty painful. One other thing is actually interesting, like when I walk around their offices and people are not like doing remote first, being very deliberate, you see a lot of situations like this. I'm not sure whether it looks familiar or not. But you see suddenly you see a lot of people having really large meeting rooms and with a, with a lot of screens available and suddenly they are interacting with each other, which is kind of interesting because it's a waste of, of, of space, right? Because why should you have this big, giant meeting room for a two-person uh, conversation? Actually, we're having one person, person there. So that's pretty, pretty interesting to see. It's just a habit and it comes back to where you say, hey, we're kind of like mimicking this office culture and we try to make it and, and, and do it remotely. And we recently had uh, quite a few people from one of our offices joining our team and it's kind of interesting what they said as well because they suddenly went from doing a lot of these video, uh, video conference meetings to more uh, meetings where they just sat on the screen and we'll come back to that. And this was kind of their reaction like, hey, I was in this meeting and was looking at a big room with a lot of people interacting. That was kind of like, it was like a terrible experience. And they have been doing that for years but they didn't notice it actually. So it's really important to get the basics right, and high-speed internet, obviously, but in some area, parts of the world, uh, that's pretty hard. For example, if you live in Australia, getting speed fast internet is, is a lot harder than one would think in a, in a well-developed country. So that's key for communication. You have to be able to hop on the vehicle like anytime. So that's what makes it hard to work in, in, in loud and noisy areas as well. So if you're always in your local Starbucks, then it's probably harder to have proper communication if you work together with a team. The other one is like having your audio and video uh, done well. Uh, having a good microphone, and it depends on your situation. If you're alone in a room, basically any microphone will work. If you're in a co-working space with other people, you probably want to have a unidirectional microphone to make sure you block out the noise from other people. And like you saw on one of the photos, some people have really good, good cameras or like lighting uh, on them because they don't want to have this dark, anonymous face while interacting. The last thing we value as well is like have a proper setup. So don't work from your bedroom, but basically make sure you have a proper desk uh, and, 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 and a door you can actually close. You can have some separation between work and life. One other thing we think is it's pretty key is, to, is having core hours. And a lot of, there's a lot of misconception between like working remotely and or distributed and, 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 and time zones because normally people start to conflate the two. And I think there's two separate problems. And that's why we try to minimize dependencies with different time zones. Like it, when we have to work together with, with the Sydney office from, from let's say New York, it's really hard to have overlap together. There's basically, uh, especially during daylight saving time, there's almost none. When it's 6 o'clock, it's like 7 a.m. at their end. So it's just really hard to get time together. And so every interaction you have almost has like this 24 hours delay. And sometimes it's required because you just have to work with a theme that happens to be there. But if you want to do it on a day-to-day -day basis, it's probably going to ruin your speed. Uh, at, at least that's our experience. So if someone has a solution for that, that would be, would be awesome. But it's really important to figure out like, hey, you have time zone issues and it totally depends on your company whether that's the case for you. And you can solve the, the, the time zone issues by having core hours. And for the Trello team, it's basically from 12 till 4 Eastern time, which is New York time. Everyone has to be online. And that's kind of what we say up front as well when we hire people. Hey, this is the expectation we have. This is where we do our meetings. And that's fine for people. So we have people in Europe, they do kind of a night shift. But we also have people in Hawaii and they start early. And the nice side effect for that person in Hawaii, he goes surfing every afternoon. So if you're okay with like getting up early, it's actually a pretty good lifestyle. And you decouple the times on issue with actually working remotely as a, as a team. And if people are not cool with that, and that, that's fine as well, but then probably the, this team is probably not the right fit. And going back to assuming remote, instead of being in this big meeting room where you have everyone on the screen, we like to use Zoom quite a bit, and 
this is called the Brady Bunch view. Um, and you, you, this is a very effective way of meeting because you can see everyone. You get a lot of non-verbal cues, which is really important. And you do the same way in a real meeting and basically say, hey, uh, I made this comment and someone started to laugh or someone was starting to frown because like, they thought it was a terrible idea. And this is like you get a very similar thing as well, maybe even better because me meetings tend to be very focused as well. And if you look closely, you see that everyone is muted. So you don't want to have any background noise as well. And again, a nice side effect of everyone being muted if someone starts to unmute themselves. It's kind of like uh, raising your hand. It's kind of like a cue. I have something to say. I want to contribute to the conversation. And this is a very effective way of meeting because you don't have to run around with meeting rooms. You don't have to, hey, I'm late for this meeting because I was stuck on the second floor and the elevator took like five minutes. It's just you click a URL and you can start chatting with each other, which is pretty cool. And this is an interesting one. If you look at how we designed the office, it's actually we have separate offices for everyone. So going back to the open office plan, most of our people are basically in their own in their own office, which makes it great because like if you have a meeting or a call, you just hop on a call, you close your door, and you're all good. Uh, which I loved a lot. Uh, it's less social, so that's a, that's that's another thing you have to solve. But like you can be really focused as well. That's one interesting thing. We're gonna switch to a new office, and we're gonna move to an open office plan so uh, we have a lot of these boxes on the side where people can just hop in but it will be an interesting experiment to see like whether that's uh, whether that's the same experience for everyone or not so you're going to find it out in uh, in a few months so we'll see how it is so that's kind of like hey how do you interact as a team so what should you do with and how do you deal uh, with building an optimal remote workspace right and what we kind of notice is that basically chat becomes your office. And this is an example of my chat box. You see there are quite a few channels being there, but that's like where people hang out. That's kind of like your new office space. It's where people chat about random stuff. They're chatting about work-related stuff. So a lot of things happening there. And it can become a problem as well because chat tools tend to be f fairly noisy as well. So you have to be really figure out like, hey, what kind of notification do you want to get and which ones you, you, you don't get. And that's why we try to keep our channels very, very focused as well. Because everyone is really focused, like, hey, some of the channels I want to be instantly replying. For example, if something happens, like we have an announcements channel, very important messages being shared. And also, like, you can't tap each other on the shoulder anymore. So if, if someone sends you a one-on-one, -on -one, it's probably important. So you want to respond fairly quickly. So that's pretty cool. It really focuses and people really tweak their, their notification setting based, based on that. And there are just a few more examples. Oh, I'm going to do it again. There are just a few examples like where we say also keep the separation between the product, where we talk about Trello as a product, but also off topic where we just chat random things. But also like for the office, we have a separate channel as well. So basically saying, hey, this is where we have local chatter, but people who are remote are probably not too interested. If they are, they can just lurk, but it's really focused and people can make a, make a choice for that. Even see it like there's a separate announcement channel, channel for the, the New York office. One other thing that was kind of interesting is uh, shouting. And it, again, it comes back to focus and making sure like, hey, you don't, you're not interrupting everyone because really people will look when they see a certain dot. And this is what I did joining the Trello team. It's like I did add here at all, hey, how is everyone doing? Which was, I kind of like for the rest of the last thing, pretty much used to do. And this is what popped up on my uh, one-on-one board with my manager after I did it like a few minutes later. So we kind of had a deliberate chat about it because this basically means like, hey, you're shouting in the office space. Like you're walking in like, hey, how is everyone doing? Is, uh, are things going well or not? So it's very disruptive for everyone. And it's like uh, some, a good hygiene for chat as well, to be very deliberate, like when you disturb people or not because you're kind of pulling people out of their focus zone, right? Which can be disruptive for people. Another thing that's pretty important, and I noticed I started to use a lot more than I used to be, is like using emojis, reaction. This is just an example for how you can do it in, within Trello, but many, many tools have the option. For example, Slack has it as well. You can react to a certain message. message. 
but the interaction you have like as a as a humans like connecting in an office space that's something that happens automatically but if you're being deliberate, deliberate about it like in a remote setting then uh, it's it's still important to have and you can actually share some extra context like how you're feeling today or like your response to a certain thing and it's very context based as well you're responding to a certain uh, certain item and it's not like all over the shop and if you have it in your tools that's that's pretty cool Okay, then about remote collaboration. I think there are three key pieces here, right? One is you have several tools, like whether you have like Confluence or whatever tool you use to collaborate or, or, or Trello. That's where you do a lot of asynchronous communication, where you hang out, write content, comment, react on, on certain things. You have chat on the other side, which is very direct. So it's asynchronous because people can decide uh, when, to react or not, uh, when to react or not. The most important thing is that you always have the ability to have like a really high bandwidth conversation. It's the same what happens in an office space, right? Like when you just go into a meeting room or you start a discussion either in chat or in a document or just sitting next to each other at some point. Hey, we need to have a proper discussion about it. Let's grab a meeting room and, and chat for a while. And that's what you will see in, 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 in doing a video call. Initially, I was trying to make the call this the pyramid of collaboration, but I think there was a little bit too much to actually give it that name. And again, uh, having the Brady Bunch view is really important in that whole as well. Like, give it a try. It's really, it's when you use it, you don't want to have anything else anymore because you can just see what everyone is doing. One other thing that's quite important as well is like having real-time tools. And the reason for having that and for it being important is actually like not everyone can be the driver. Like normally, if you if you zoom in on um, on a screen or whatever, it will always be, or share your screen for whatever, you actually use uh, one person as a driver and everyone else becomes very passive. And if you have a real-time tool, then everyone, everyone can be the driver. And I just collected a few examples. Obviously, there's Trello, but that's where the product comes in as well again, right? Where you basically say, hey, I can see what everyone is doing because it's like everyone has the same view and that's where our remote practice comes back into a product. You see, I have Zoom on the on the right side. That's kind of like my favorite setup. So you can actually work and collaborate together, but you can both drive, which is still, this is really high bandwidth uh, focus. Another example is, is Confluence or any real-time document system you have. You can just write something together and say, hey, this is how I want to collaborate. And maybe one other interesting one is like, hey, a lot of questions like, how do you do whiteboarding? Because that's what we do a lot in the office. And that's fine. That is true, but that's, Pretty hard to do uh, remotely. Uh, there are a few, quite a few good tools around. This is Mural. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit hard because you can't do many things. But what I really li like about Mural is that you see each other's like cursors going around, like in the screen. So you can actually see what the other person is doing. So it's very, very interactive. And it's important to like drop the physical space and say, "Hey, I'm not gonna try to mimic it anymore. I'm just gonna go fully remote." And like you s we saw earlier in this mini room, we try to do that in the office like all the time. And there are, you see that coming back in tools as well. Uh, did ever anyone ever use a whiteboard camera? Oh, there's one person. Which is we have one in the office as well, and it was, uh, it was like an interesting thing. I never used it myself, but it, again, you have one person that's very active, and there's one poor soul being remotely and maybe giving some directions on the, on, on the phone or whatever, but it's just this very active and passive setup, which is not like e equaling uh, the, the playing field or leveling the play field. The other one is interesting, like there are a lot of tools around uh, digital whiteboards, and which is probably fine if you're both in the office space, but if, if you try to do it like having the other people on the other side, uh, we tried it a bit, uh, I never seen it very successful, but it's just my opinion, but it's kind of like we're having this whiteboard thing and we're trying to make it, uh, make it work in a remote mode setting. And the last thing, it was before my time at Trello, but apparently they had telepresence robots, so you could actually control yourself on an iPad and a stick and run through the office. But we kind of gave up on that because it was very creepy, because you would look back and like, hey, there's someone watching at me. But it was a nice experiment. So realize that like everything you want to do is on your computer now. Basically, your computer just became your office. That's the only thing you need. And the rest is just like nice little tools to, to make, it, make it helpful. So having a large screen is still beneficial. But uh, having a laptop it is basically enough. And that makes it great for traveling around. That's just on the remote office space. Last thing I want to talk about is hey, how do you actually deal 
with remote culture. And remote culture is an interesting one. And I think culture in general is an interesting thing because we throw it around all the time, but what does it actually mean and, and, and what's the impact of that? And if you look at the definition, it's kind of straightforward. It's uh, the behavior and attitudes of a certain group of people. Uh, so what does it mean if when people work remotely together? Like, where do you focus on them and, and what's important to look at? There are three things that are, I think, key for remote culture. First of all, you have to build a lot of trust. Secondly, like, hey, you have to build some sort of connection as a team, right? Because like, hey, you don't see each other every day anymore. How do you build connection? How do you feel like a sense of belonging to, to, to your team? And the last thing is like having empathy for each other because you can't see where everyone is and like where people are at in their life, whether they had a bad day or not. You have to build some sort of empathy for, for each other. So let's have a look at, at trust first. And I think trust is key in every environment. So whenever you work together as a group of people, having trust in the interaction we have is, is really Im important. But I think even more, you have to work really hard in a remote environment to build it. So how can you build uh, some trust? First of all, you have to make sure you hire people that can work remotely. Right? Not everyone is, 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 is keen on doing so. Like if you like to be in the office, if you like to hang around people, then maybe remote is not for you. If you're just getting started in your profession, then remote might be a bit of a, bit of a push. Probably nice to have someone close to you who can mentor you and guide you a little bit. We did experiment with that a little bit because we hired some people who already had professional experience, but not a little less of engineering experience. And that actually worked pretty well. Uh, but for so far, like people just coming, uh, just graduate, we just have them in the office space. It's also important to have like proactive communicators because people will be working on problems by themselves. So if they don't call out like I am stuck or I'm done, can what what's next? That's really important to have people like that in place. Um, if you look at what the Basecamp team actually says, they call it the manager of one. So basically people who can manage their own workspace and actually can focus on their own goals. So look at that when you interview people, say, do you think those people are able to do so or already have a lot of experience working remotely? The second thing, and especially like if you're a manager or something like that, like you have to focus on, on outcomes, right? So you have to really make sure that you actually don't focus on people being around anymore and so you really have to find mechanisms to say hey how do you actually know what people are doing so like hey what are you contributing to the team how active are they in discussions etc so that's really important as well i was talking to someone today and where they tried to do some sort of remote thing and that didn't go very well at some point management kind of decided like hey this is not something we want and that's why at Trello, for example, like half of the leadership team is, is remote as well. So you really have to go for it. And it's also good that like senior people actually experience it and say, hey, this is, this is how, uh, how, what the impact, impact is of being remote. And you actually like change how we work and how we run as a company. If that's not the case, then there's always a risk where people say, hey, it's not working out. Let's, let's scale it instead of fixing uh, the root problem. And the last thing, like, like I mentioned before, like create that visibility and have your roadmaps, have your, uh, your boards with, with work publicly available. Find a channel where people can follow along so they can actually say, hey, but what went on this week on this project and, and what's going on? What also is important is uh, making decisions transparent. Like uh, we use DAISY's lot, which stands for decider, approver, collaborator, and informed. Uh, you can find it on, uh, if you Google Atlassian Playbook, then you will see a lot of plays. This is one of them. Actually, this is a really simple way of like formalizing how you make decisions and also like how do you make decisions transparent. This is all uh, available for everyone. So you can basically like make sure that people can chime in into a problem. Like, because like I said before, normally you have conversations during lunch, lunch and serendipity that happens and that's not the case remotely anymore. So this is a good way to actually say, hey, I saw you're working on these things. I have an opinion as well and you can join the conversation. We do the same for more technical decision. I think the previous one is more like, hey, what options do I have and make an option for, for, uh, for, for, for a decision. But if you wanna go really deep into a technical problem, we use a very simple mechanism. We just have a, have a Git repo where uh, we just open a pull request. It's just a markdown file, and that's where people start to comment. Like you have on a piece of code, we just start to commenting and get feedback on, 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 on how people want to implement stuff. The reason why we created the such is because we saw a lot of like things coming in, and, and just before 
uh, and during a uh, code review, there were a lot of assumptions made that were in truth. So to actually share knowledge and actually make it really visible how people were thinking about designing a system, this really helped. It's a very simple system. You don't need like big documents. It's just like, hey, the first thing you do, you write up. Maybe it's one line if it's a simple feature. This is what we're going to do to the code base, and this is why. And people will respond if they have an opinion or just say approve, looks good to me. And again, this allows everyone to actually jump into a conversation and actually share the things, you, things that are going on. And I think it's even uh, very valuable to do this in, in any company, right? For example, if you have a mobile team uh, and they're afraid you're breaking their API, this is very beneficial because the mobile team can just keep an eye on this and, and, and raise an alarm if they see something weird. So it's a very cheap way of keeping everyone informed. One other thing is connection. So normally when you in a company or an office space, you build connection during lunch, during events, activities, whatever, or just during meetings. Like you have a few minutes before, so you can chat, you can hang around, you get to know each other a little bit better. So we have a few strategies around it as well. First of all, onboarding. And whenever someone new starts, we, if that person is remote, we fly them to the office with at least one of their mentors and maybe preferably a little bit more of the team. And they spend the first week together trying to ship something into production if it's a more engineering role and actually connect with the people. We go out for dinner on Monday night with everyone in, in the office who wants to join. And that's a very nice way of just getting a sense of belonging for the company you just started for and, and making some new friends in the, in the workplace. Actually, my wife, she works for a remote-only company, so her first job, was a first day was actually like opening a box with this new laptop, which was kind of like a very interesting experience. It worked out pretty well, but it was kind of like, hey, I think I work for this company now. So it's really helpful for us that we actually have an office and we can actually invite people over for, for the first week. It's also important for teams that they make time to actually hang out. And what a lot of teams do is like schedule 30 minutes to an hour, depends on the size of the team, just to hop on a call and actually have a chat and chat about things. What they did during the weekend, what's going on, uh, whether they read a, MOOC, uh, a, a new book or just saw this awesome movie, just have time to hang out and chat on things besides work. And that's just a, a, a very nice way to socialize. The other one we do quite a bit is, is off-site. So you probably need a little bit more travel budget than you normally would like to have. But hey, you probably can save quite a bit of money on, on office space. So like spend that on having people together. And make sure you, you can build connections in, in, in that sense as well. And also like workshop and, and have for this really high bandwidth weeks where you can just get a lot of stuff done as, as a group. One thing we do as a company as well, or as a product, I should say, is like travel together. And it's like one one week, a few days a year, we just come somewhere and we just hang out. And the first time I went, I thought like, hey, we're probably going to do a lot of workshop activities and have some fun uh, during the night. It was basically, we only did like team building activities. So there was no real work things going on. We just did a, did a lot of time, spent a lot of time to connect because that's something we can't do remotely. But that's something we can do when we are toge together as a group. So that's a really important and easy way of like getting together. Also around town halls, uh, who is like who has in regular town halls of like all the company just in in their office? Uh, quite a few people. Any anyone who's doing that remotely, like having multiple offices, like I see one hand or a few hands actually, and. And I see, observe it in, in, uh, with a lot of teams as well, especially like sometimes there are teams they have like 50 people in one location, three people in another location. And if you uh, observe it, it's, it kind of looks a bit sad. You see three people in this big meeting room and on the other side you see 100 people and there's no real connection. Uh, this is what we used to do for Trello as well, but we kind of like switch away to do it remote friendly too. So there's no meeting room anymore. But everyone who is in the office actually dials in and again, Zoom as well. And the Brady Bunch view kind of scales quite well until 40 people or so. But it's actually nice that everyone hangs out. You have some time to chat beforehand and we take time to chat afterwards. But it's kind of like everyone connects on, this, on, the, on the same level and it makes it a really fun way of interacting with each other. And also an effective way of communicating like what's going on in, in the company. One other thing is like, hey, how do you reinstate your, your core values as a, as a company, right? Like, I think it's important for every, for every company to say, hey, this is how we want to work together. 
And one strategy we use like as part of every time we kind of like read them up out loud. So basically say, like, this is where we stand for as a company. And that's just really reiterating actually like over communicating like how we want to work and how we want to play together as a company. I think I mentioned the word serendipity already a few times and that's what happens in the office space a lot. You just bump into someone, maybe even a completely different department and you have an interesting conversation where you learn something, you might even help out on a, on a certain situation. It doesn't happen in a, in a remote environment. So to, to make that happen, we actually have a bot. It's called, the bot is called Mr. Rogers. It's an American TV series from the 60s, I think. It's, it's like the tagline is, meet your neighbor. And that's what we try to mimic, right? We basically have a bot that creates meetings for everyone like once a month. And then we just hang out in a Zoom with five people. And then those people are selected randomly. So if you have bad luck, you hang out with people you already know very well. But normally it's pretty interesting. You always have a set of people you, you know, you know their names, but you know, don't, don't know them very well. In this sense, it's just a great way to connect and actually mimic that. That, hey, I just bumped into you, bumped into you in, the, in the office space quite a bit. Uh, it actually started to break down a little bit when we grew and what we do now a lot is after the town hall we actually do it deliberately because it's easy to say hey I have this 30 minute meeting uh, on my calendar but I have some other stuff to do so I kind of cancel it so this kind of like reinforced it that we find it really important to hang out as a group. The same for, for events right because what happens a lot with, especially when you're just a few people remote then you kind of miss out on all the fun stuff. So you get new t-shirts, ah, what about the remote people? Um, if you uh, have an activity, like what happens there? So we try to, if you have, for example, swag, we try to send them out as well. Like even as t-shirts, this is kind of like the New York office logo. We have a logo for remote as well. So people who are in the remote office, they have like a, a specific t-shirt for the remote office, which is pretty cool. But also when we do events, so once a year we go out with the office and just hang out and, and get some sun. And everyone who is remote gets budgets as well to actually hang out with friends as well. And to reinstate, to actually say, hey, this is what happened. And a lot of good stuff happened. Everyone is We have a trailer board that people share their pictures and say, hey, this is what I did. I went hiking or I went to this bowling alley and had, had, had a great time. So this is a really fun way of actually saying, like this, is, like, this is how we have fun as a team. Even if you're remote, you're still having these nice activities to do. And... That brings an important point as well. To make that happen, it's really important to have some sort of like balancing a team as well. For Trello, we have around 60% of people are remote, which is important to us because like if you just have a few people, you will always optimize into a certain direction. So with this, you kind of like force yourself to be really careful, like how do we deal with certain things? We have an office, but we also have mo a lot of people remote. So we want to optimize these two things and, and provide a great workplace experience for, for both groups of people. Okay, there's one last thing I want to chat about, and that's more about empathy. And I think this is important in every office space uh, to have some sort of humility in how you interact with each other, but especially in a remote environment, where because you kind of don't know each other, uh, maybe that well how you respond to a certain situation. And that's kind of really important to make sure in your daily interaction, you always keep it in mind, like, hey, why is someone uh, responding as such? I'm not sure whether people are familiar with the Atlassian values. Uh, these are our values. I'm not going to read them out loud. You can read them and you can find them on the internet as well. But we always had this sixth unofficial uh, value and we call it like seek first and understand. And when the trailer team joined us, it was actually fun to see they had a similar one. They call it assume positive intent. So basically instead of like when people make a remark or a statement or say something and it comes across as like, hey, this is uh, an aggressive statement. This is weird. I don't understand why people did it. Just keep in mind that like people are writing stuff up. It might be late in, in that time zone. They might just have a bad day at home. They just dropped coffee on the new carpet, for example. So I always try to find out why a person actually had that behavior and say, hey, I did, it came across as, as, as quite rude or just a, a weird sentence. It also like is interesting when you have different cultures and different nationalities mixing up together because people tend to commute differently in different countries actually. So it's really good to keep it in mind. I think it's good to do it in every company, but it's more and more important in a remote company. And this is kind of like a fun example, like truly really easy to make a mistake and, and mess up a message if you can do so. 
There's one more thing, and that's all around providing context. Like whenever you commu communicate, provide some context like, hey, why are you asking a certain question? And especially when you don't interact, you don't, uh, in chat, you actually don't see well, what kind of setting people are asking things. If you provide context, it's, 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 a, it's a way better thing of like communicating. And this is an, an interesting example where you basically say, hey, well, how is this project going for Q4? And if you look the one on, on the side, it's the, the first one could come across like very stressful, like almost like it's distrust. But the second one, it's kind of really like, hey, I'm just interested and I have a valid reason for that. And the reason is not like I'm not trusting you. I just needed information to get my own job done. So having that in place is actually pretty important and keeping that in mind while interacting. Okay. This is mostly what I wanted to share, so let's wrap up a little bit. I think we all had a lot of knowledge during this this conference already. It's day four. Uh, it's one morning to go. But I think you, if you want to remember anything, just remember these three things. Uh, why should you consider remote? First of all, like access to talent. That's really important. So it's not... Uh, as a, a way of saving things, basically, like hey, you get suddenly have this large talent pool, which, especially in our industry, is very is, is is a competitive advantage, if you like. Second one, if you go remote, everyone goes remote, so you have to assume remote and basically change the way you work as a team when the first person decides to go remote. So be deliberate about it. So if you're not sure, have a good conversation about it with your team. Say hey. If this person goes remote, we have to change the way we work and have to adapt, and also continue to learn because. What works for us might not work for your organization, so try to figure out like what works and what doesn't work and actually say, okay, cool, we're going to change a little bit. And the last one is like, just be nice to each other and try to understand why someone is behaving as they are. Uh, and I think that's good in, in every single company. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. We have a few minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer a few. So the question was like, why are core hours so, so important? Uh, that's a decision we made as a company. I think for us it's important to have at least some overlap, to have like time to meet and make, make decisions. Uh, so this gives you the guarantee you always have some sort of overlap. Not sure whether you, with, the, with the team in the US, whether you have overlap. So you, you probably have because you're in Europe. The reason for us is important, for example, we work a lot with teams like in Sydney as well because we have a, have a big office there. And then it becomes really painful. So if you... If if you so Europe is a perfect perfect time zone where you can still work for U.S. companies. Yeah, yeah, uh, th I agree. Uh, I think it's it's a subset of talent, right? I think it's agree. It, it's a decision people have to make, and that's why we're very upfront with them. Like bef during the hiring, this kind of expectation we have. So there are people who are saying like, "Hey, that's not for me," which is fine as well. Uh, and we try to hire only people that like it's in a time zone where it's acceptable. For example, we wouldn't hire someone in Sydney and say, "Hey, you have to work from 1 a.m. till 7 a.m. every morning," because that's that's not uh, not not feasible. But it's again, it's a personal decision. All right. Thank you. Have enjoyed the rest of your conference and your night.